everyone, I'm Jackson, and I'm taking the long way home to Sydney, Australia with my amazing girlfriend, Xanthi, on our boat, Finding Avalon. We recently completed the Atlantic crossing, and we wanted to share with you a more technical episode that goes through the planning and provisioning that went into it. We've already released several episodes on the amazing experience we had over the last 19 days, and we really hope you enjoy this one too. Now firstly, I'm going to caveat this by saying I'm still learning how to plan a long passage and the strategies around it. It's really important to have a strategy for your passage so that way you can accurately plan your provisions. Now before the crossing, I estimated that with a consistent 15 knots of breeze, we would be able to average about 6 knots. And therefore, our estimated 3000 nautical mile passage will take us about 21 days. I also worked out that in the worst case scenario, if we were only able to maintain 4.5 knots, that would also take us 28 days. So as a baseline, we planned for a 21 day crossing with a contingency of seven days. In reality, we only traveled 2,850 miles and we achieved that in 19 days, which is bang on 150 miles a day and we averaged 6.3 knots. Our worst day was 105 miles, our best day was 165, which was probably the day that Neil sailed for almost 12 hours. We didn't have any fancy spinnakers or jennikers and we simply sailed with a pulled out Genoa and mainsail, wing on wing. Work out what kind of speed and distance you can do for the sail configuration you're anticipating to use. Next, in regards to the Atlantic crossing, we were leaving from the Canaries and making our way to St. Lucia in the Caribbean. Now you most likely want to head south for a few days before you make a right hand turn and head straight for the Caribbean. For our crossing, we headed south for about 600 miles before we got into consistent trade winds, made our right hand turn and sailed the next 2200 nautical miles straight to St. Lucia. When looking at the weather models, we favoured between 15 and 20 knots of breeze, and that suited our boat, our crew, and our sail configuration. With this breeze, we could comfortably maintain our speed of six knots. Anything above 25 knots, we started to make mistakes and put more pressure on the boat than we wanted to. Under 12 knots became uncomfortable with the roll of the sea and were unable to maintain a good speed. So think about the ability of your crew and your boat and try to choose favorable wind conditions that suit you. As simple as it sounds, our general rule of thumb was to safely sail as fast as we could 24 hours a day on the closest point of sail to our destination. In regards to weather information, we used our Iridium Go to download weather models daily. This helped us decide when to make our right hand turn towards the Caribbean and ensure we were deeply in the trade. It also helped us avoid patches of light breeze and heavy breeze and combined with the information pro provided by the ARC, we had pretty accurate weather models. It's really important to stay up to date with your weather conditions so that way you know what's coming. You might be coming into seven days of really light weather and therefore that might start putting pressure on your provisions and you might start rethinking how you use them. Water. The first thing to work out is the storage capacity on your boat. On Avalon, we have five separate tanks. We have one in the bow, one under each seat in the saloon, and one under each bed in the back cabins. Now, between those five tanks, we have a maximum of 450 liters. The next thing to do is work out your water usage. We said as a minimum that each person would use 4.5 liters a day, and that includes drinking, cooking, cleaning, etc., etc. At 28 days, for four people, that equals 504 liters. Now, if we realistically go for our target passage of 21 days, that means each person has a capacity of four liters a day. So, we took an extra 80 liters of bottled water, and that took our total up to 530 liters, meaning we had about 30 liters of contingency. Given that we had no means of making water on passage, we had to be very precious and protective of our water storage. The five tanks in Avalon can all be isolated from each other. This is a bonus for consumption, as you can monitor it easily, but also it protects your water in case one of your tanks becomes spoiled or ruptured, and that way you don't lose, lose all your water. In terms of using water, we had a five liter bottle that was in the kitchen at all times with a hand pump on top. Whenever we emptied it, we simply filled it back up with the filtered tap water, and kept a tally on how many times we reef. This allowed us to track our consumption and also reduced any waste. To minimize the chance of any incidents of water being wasted, we also taped up any taps that could be left on and we made sure the water pump was off at all times. Finally, our saltwater foot pump really came into its own on the crossing. It allowed us to wash up all the time and we weren't worried about wasting water in regards to washing up. So, 
I'd really recommend installing a saltwater foot pump. With this system in mind, we arrived in St. Lucia after 19 days and we still had 250 litres of water left. Therefore, we only really used about 280 litres and we're quite proud of that. Maybe the crew could have done with an extra shower or two. So we briefly covered food provisioning in a previous episode, but we thought that we would go into a bit more detail about how we organised it in the end. So to start with, I wrote a meal plan for an expected three week crossing, plus an extra week for if the worst should happen. This included breakfast, lunch, dinner and snacks, and a few drinks. The first week entailed just all fresh produce, the second week entailed a mixture of fresh and dry, and then the third week was mostly long life stuff, and the fourth week was kind of desperate stuff like canned meat. So a typical example of what we ate would be toast, cereal, eggs, porridge, soaked oats for breakfast. We like to keep it quite varied so we didn't get bored. And for lunch we would have things like Spanish omelettes, pasta and sandwiches. Dinners were things like curry, roast vegetables and pasta bake. So I worked out the portions for each ingredient and multiplied them by four people and by the weeks that we were having them. So for example, pasta. We eat about 125 grams per person we worked out. We had planned 15 pasta meals approximately and there were four of us. So that meant that we needed seven and a half kilograms of pasta. Now, I'm not going to go into every meal that we had and every single food item that we bought, but if you look at the description below, you can see my shopping list. So firstly, you need to in include the crew quite heavily. Everyone's quite invested in... <laughs> Uh -huh. in what they're going to be eating for the next 21 days approximately so they need to have a good say in it so I included the crew about two months prior to the crossing secondly really important you need to include some grab and go meals into your plan these are for the days when it's too dangerous to be cooking in the galley or everyone's tired and sick so I suggest that at least a third of your meals are ready prepared or just ready to eat now Examples that we used in that case would be Spanish omelette, pizzas, and ready prepared pasta salad. Finally, do your research on the shelf life of foods and how best to store them. There's nothing worse than tossing rotten fruit or veg overboard. You also need to bank on about 5% of your food perishing. So we found that oranges and apples lasted the whole crossing, just as long as you don't keep them together. Citrus, you need to wrap in tin foil for it to last that long. Um, make sure you check your fresh food every day. If there are any mouldy ones, they will make all the rest go mouldy, so throw them out straight away. Fresh fruit and veg that lasted us the whole crossing were oranges and apples, potatoes, onions, pumpkins, squashes, and cabbage. Now cabbage, the best way to tackle that is just to peel it off leaf by leaf, don't cut into it, then it will last you for weeks. They are, they would survive a nuclear bomb I think. Eggs will last you the whole trip as long as you turn the box over every two days. We were still eating our eggs after the crossing about three weeks after the crossing. Before you bring the food on board, this is really important. Make sure that you remove all cardboard as it can harbour cockroach eggs. Also clean thoroughly your fruit and veg as those can have all sorts of nasties on them. Another really important thing is make sure that you include some surprises into the plan just to keep everyone interested through the whole trip. There's one thing I would have done differently if I had my time over. I would have made the plan a little bit more flexible rather than designing really specific meals because we did find that cooking was the one creative outlet for the crew and people <laughs> tended to go wild when they were cooking and went a bit off piste. So it would have been nice if we had a bit more flexibility there. So I've written some recipes and a few cooking hacks at sea for anyone who's interested to learn more and those are on our blog so check out the link below. <laughs> Now, with all that cooking, you need to consider how much gas you're going to use. Normally on Avalon, we use one bottle every three to four weeks. However, on the crossing, we were using one bottle every eight days, which makes sense given that we had four people on separate schedules and the boat was operating 24 hours a day. I provisioned for two gas bottles for the entire crossing, plus I kept a sneaky third one for an emergency. By day 16, our second gas bottle was done and we're already onto the emergency gas. So make sure you pack way more gas than you think you're going to use. Also, make sure you leave with full bottles. There was a horror story 
of a boat leaving with two half empty bottles by mistake. Take double of whatever you think you might use or employ some pretty strict usage instructions. Finally, consider the type of climate you're gonna be sailing in. The first seven days of our crossing was pretty cold and bitter and a lot of our gas was just used on tea and coffee especially on the night watches. As it got warmer, we started drinking less hot drinks and therefore saved gas. So think about the types of climates you're in and realistically how much gas you're gonna be using. The next question is how much fuel should you take? Now, on Avalon, we have a 27 horsepower engine and when operating about 2000 RPMs, we use about two liters an hour. Besides our solar, the engine is our main source of power to recharge the batteries. Now, our fuel tank has a capacity of 165 litres. We also took an extra 80 litres in jerry cans, a total of 245 litres. Assuming that you're not going to be able to use all your capacity down the bottom of your tank by minus 10%, which brought us to 220 litres of fuel. Over 28 days, this meant that we could use about 7.8 litres a day, or we could run the engine for about four hours a day. However, by day two, our batteries were really low. The solar was not keeping up with our consumption due to the rolling and we also had quite cloudy conditions. And in reality, our consumption was much higher than we expected, given that the boat was operating 24 hours a day. So we ended up running the engine for three hours every day. We chose to run the engine in the mornings between five and eight. This meant that the batteries were full by about 8 a.m right when our solar would start to kick in. The solar would then keep up with consumption just about during the day and as night fell, our batteries would be around 90%. Over the next 12 hours, the batteries would then fall again to 50% until about 5 a.m. when we'd turn the engine back on. Now, we were blessed with great wind during our crossing, and over the 19 days, we probably only motored about 10 hours due to light wind, and therefore we finished the crossing with 100 liters left. So, my advice, carefully plan your fuel consumption and leave a really good contingency for light wind or any emergency. Also, Make sure you log your engine hours pretty carefully and then that way you can easily monitor your consumption and you're not playing the guessing game of how much is really in the tank. So to recap, we ran our engine for three hours every day just to keep up with our power consumption and therefore we used about 150 litres of fuel. Anyway guys, I really hope you enjoyed that episode. Uh, there was a lot of information in there, but I hope you found it very valuable and I hope it helps you plan your next long passage and hopefully cross an ocean. Thanks guys.